Well guys, this is one hot mess of a video. <laughs> oh goodness. So first I recorded a thing telling you what I was going to be doing, but as you'll see in the middle of it, I decided it's too complicated and I can't focus on both trying to figure it out. I should have looked first, but I wanted to open it with you guys and well, that didn't work. And, uh, but the video that I did telling you I was going to do all this is gone. It's just gone. So here I am going, uh, now what? So here's me telling you that I, here we are. It's 1st of October. So we're going to talk about the end of my September reads, the last half of September. So I'm going to make myself, I'm making myself a cup of tea while, while this is going on. Um, and then we're just going to sit down. We're just going to talk books because books and, uh, yeah, <laughs> The lighting is terrible because I wanted to try to do this thing here and it had to be at night. Everything, this video is just a hot mess, but you know what? Hey, too bad. It, this is me. This is, this is what you get. You just get the mess that I am and I, I'm okay with that. So let's talk books. Okay. The first book that I read I'm going to try to put this back here kind of out of the way. But the first book that I read in the second part was this Between the Lines. And this is by Jan Fields. And not by Rachel Phillips like I wondered that time. Remember I mentioned that once? Yeah, it wasn't. It was Jan Fields. I was totally wrong. Okay. But anyway, so this book is the first in the Rose Cottage Mysteries. Uh, or Rose Cottage Book Club. I don't remember which it is. Let's see. And it's Rose Cottage Book Club. Um, we're going to play with this. So in this, you know, she's got herself a bookshop on Nantucket. And the bookshop, she's starting a book club. Only a few people come the first time, which is actually really good because then you get to know these characters. But it is definitely a mystery kind of thing. There's some interesting things going on. And this? so the owner of the shop, and I can't remember her name. What's her name? Megan. They end up kind of having a few things. It looks like something's going on with one of the woman's husbands. And they don't know what that is. It looks like, <laughs> check out this multi-page instruction book with small, I might add, small illustrations. So there's, this will be taking us quite a while. And then book stickers. Oh, cool. Maybe we'll make books tonight because that shouldn't require a lot of reading. So book stickers and more book stickers. I love it. I love it. Right now, I'm just seeing what's even in here. So, um, here's the deal. So, there's, it's one of those misunderstandings situations where if they had just talked, it would be solved. But because they usually talk so much, the wife isn't really calm. Guys, I gotta say, this is this is very solid. This is nice. This is good chipboard, and it's I, I'm impressed. Anyway, but I shouldn't be interrupting like that. But this time, because they are usually so in tune, this out of tuneness when she tries to talk to him and he brushes it off, that unnerves her, and it it's logical in my opinion that she wouldn't be uh what's the word I'm looking for she wouldn't be eager to keep asking when he's being so unlike himself you know and so as as much as I might normally not have liked the conversational bit or whatever I think it works. I do think it works for this particular book. And that's good because, you know, 
I'm just saying. Uh, normally, like I said, I wouldn't like it, but I, I did for this and I, it works and, um, we shall see what happens. What my biggest problem, I think I gave it four stars, which was a little generous. Normally I would have given it three, three and a half, but I do love the characters. I do love the setting. And I think that this series might be pretty good. Do you know how you have to like weave the backstory and stuff and the setup and everything into the story? Well, it feels to me like we have the backstory and the setup and she's weaving the story into that in this one. And I, I think I've already said that once somewhere, but so that was between the lines. And then next came, it was an audiobook, so I'll have to put the image up, but came the Scottish Ladies Detective Agency. And this one, I, I think I'm going to listen to more of the series. I, it was, the, a narrator was pretty awesome. And the characterization was awesome. The mysteries, okay, so in this one, there's been this rash of thefts at country houses when there's parties. And so to figure out who is doing this, the woman hires these two detectives. It's their, they just opened, these women have just opened their detective agency. And she hires them to, be, you know, come in as, as if they were guests and try to figure out who's doing it, basically to protect her own guests from being stolen from. And they solve the crime and they go back and there are other Things that are all interconnected. They get new cases and lesser cases and all that fun stuff. I don't think I want to do these because I'm going to have to read more about that. So I won't do that. Let's just say that if, if we are not careful, they really have to be clever to solve these cases. They are getting into disguises. They are you know, following people around, they're getting into dangerous situations, but not foolishly. Although there's a time or two that you're like, seriously, what are you not thinking? So there are those, yes. But for the most part, they, they just don't really overdo it, which is kind of nice. Okay. I just got to admit, it's kind of nice that it's not this constant overdone thing. Well, okay, this idea wasn't a good one, so I'm going to hit pause and continue in just a second because this, 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 this didn't work. I think that will be too confusing. Let me put that back. I'll be right back. Okay, so <laughs> that just didn't work. So I'm going to bring my laptop over here so that I have my notes still. And I'll just eat my, this is good, guys. My daughter made blueberry lemon cinnamon, cinnamon, they're that good. <laughs> blueberry lemon cinnamon rolls yesterday, and they're so good. Eat that too. So the deal is, is that, you know, they, they do go on a lot of these kind of adventures, and they, they do get into some danger. Some of it is totally necessary. Some of it is inexperience, and I kind of like that they did that. And then some of it is just, it's par for the course. And people do underestimate them because they're women. And that works in their favor. And it's also part of the problem with the series. So I only gave it four stars. It's the first book. And I'm hoping that being the first book, it means that we won't see this all the time. This won't be a constant recurring theme. But it got downright preachy about the poor downtrodden women of the early 1800s or 1900s. I think it was early 1900s because there's cars. Anyway, um, now you do want historical stuff to bring up issues of the day. And if I recall correctly, like Scottish women got the vote before English women or something. And so there was that whole thing. But we know women didn't have the same rights as men at the time. And we know that uh, men often... 
I, I sit down and say a word and they decide they've got to chew their feet. They've got to drink some water. They got to bark at the dog next door. Hello, how are you over there? I, I just, I am unable to can. <laughs> and that's kind of the problem that I have is that I don't know any person who doesn't know that women 110 years ago or so and women today have different rights. We know this. And so because what authors tend to forget that we do know this thing, it's like they all rehash the same thing. And it's not necessarily each individual author's fault that we know this. And it's like, not again. But on the other hand, it kind of is because authors need to know this. And there's a way to bring in the obvious without harping on it so much. And if it had just been a natural interactions, which there were, and those were good, Instead of, you know, her assistant constantly preaching about the evils of everybody in every book can't be enlightened to modern sensibilities back in the past. It becomes anachronistic and it becomes annoying. And so I, I expect that to happen and I'm going to be really sad if it does because it, it's pushing today's narrative into the past and then we lose the difference between today and the past. The point is, is it feels like we're pushing a modern sensibility into the past. So as long as this doesn't keep being a problem, I'm going to keep reading and I'm going to keep enjoying. If it keeps becoming a problem, well, then yeah, we're going to have to have issues. Okay, the next one is, I might have should have gotten, Eating that makes that taste a little, maybe I want a sugar cube. Okay, so the next one I listened to, uh, I think it was when I took Kayleen to the airport, but Juniper Bean resorts to murder. If you love rom-coms and you love mysteries, this is the book for you. Even with a few slight uncomfortablenesses in this book, I gave it five stars, absolutely loved it, can't wait to read another one. It was laugh out loud funny. I, was this the one? I think this is the one. Yeah, because I was on the 15th, so I had to be. I pulled over because I was laughing so hard at one point. It was just so utterly ludicrous, but it was so real. So guys, if you ever want to know the crazy, idiotic, and just unbelievable things that authors do, to make sure that what they're writing works. You gotta read this book. <laughs> so in this one, Juniper Bean has, she's an independent romance author, but she's got a problem. She keeps killing her main characters. So she thinks maybe, stop it Neville, stop it. She thinks maybe what she needs to do is start writing mysteries. And so she's trying to learn how to write a mystery now. And she's trying to, you know, create the the whole scenario and everything. And in the process, she is moving back to the town that she grew up in. She had a difficult childhood with a mother who was an alcoholic and made life very difficult for her. She was often hungry. She ended up in foster care. There's, you know, she had a rough past, but she did love her mother. And I loved that part of it in particular. In addition... Uh, so she, you know, she gets a, she gets a roommate and, uh, okay. So there's this opening scene. I, do I tell, do I tell the opening scene? Uh, let me see if they, let me see if they tell you in the, in the synopsis. Okay. So they don't tell you. And I feel like I shouldn't, but there is this thing in the opening scene it might be on the audio sample. And by the way, the audio was fantastic. So the opening scene might be in the audio sample. And if it is, you really should go listen because it is such a hoot. And then the, uh, this is from the synopsis. I can read this because this is, this is just the book. In, in Juniper Bean has big plans for her writing career. 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 Swoony kisses, sigh-inducing happily ever afters, and she's going to write them all. There's just one problem. She can't seem to 
stop killing off her main characters. And then, you know, so she gets to town. She discovers that her roommate is someone who actually tutored her in high school. And there's a whole backstory there. He's not happy. His sister is cracking up. His sister's a hoot. And so there's there's so much going on. He has a really wonderful, stable, uh, everything. His family is everything her family wasn't. They are such opposites. And one of the best things about their chemistry, if you will, is that they're both thoroughly and completely authentically themselves. He will ask the tough questions. He will say the hard thing to be like, go away. I don't want to talk to you. No, this is not going to be a thing. And and she will just, she'll just push anyway. I mean, all the things that most fictional characters will back away from, this gal just has them going for it. And it's smart. It's so good. The scenes where she's trying to figure out what to do and will this work and can you get in all oh, the bathroom with the window. I'm just saying if you do if you read this for no other reason, just her trying to figure out if she can get through a bathroom window is hilarious. And okay, this is where it comes in. There is there's no there are no actual full-on intimate scenes that I recall. I don't think there's... A, well, there's none There's none on the page for sure, but I don't even think there's a closed-door scene. But there is intense attraction that sometimes we get to experience. It, I'm calling it spicy attraction. I mean, I was uncomfortable, but I'm a prude. I'm uncomfortable reading A Simple Kiss. I flipped the page. I'm the one who wrote the character who people waited for I don't know, three, four books to read, and finally the kiss comes, and oh, guess what? Yeah, I thought it was in this book. Shatona made it so discreet that readers couldn't find it. Because, yeah, I actually wrote a book. It's called 31 Kisses. I wrote a book where there was a kiss a day pact for the very purpose of making me so that I could get through it without wanting to heave. Okay. And for those who think that there is something seriously wrong with me, why don't I love kisses? Um, can I just say I have nine kids? Okay. Okay. There is a big difference between the, the closed door in real life and intruding on someone else's. I'm just not comfortable. Okay. I'm just, that's as deep as I'm going to get with it. But this book was so much fun. I want to see if uh, it's happily ever after homicide number one. I wonder if there's going to be a second one. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. Is it out? No way. Oh, it's out. When did it, when did it release? It released October 5th. Heidi Lucy loses her mind. Okay. We're going to go find out uh, Audible. We're going to find out if it's available. Because if it's available, I'm I'm listening to a book that I'm not loving the narrator, but I am loving the story. But I might just skip it. Heidi Lucy. Loses. <gasps> oh. Oh. It's pre-order. Okay. When does it come out? When does it come out? It comes out on 11-7. Okay. So here's my first TBR book for November. Even I will, I will listen to this before I will read Fox. And I've been looking forward to Fox for over a year. I'm just saying, because it was, it was really, really that much fun. So there's that. Then, uh, okay. I can close her out. So, but anyway, the, the story is engaging. It's funny. It's great. The mystery is good and it's not crazy predictable, even though it is. I mean, I knew who did it. It was obvious to me the second I met the murderer, I knew that 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 person was the murderer. I'm being really careful here. But over and over and over, there were reasons to doubt it. And then that person did something that solidified it for me. And I think we're supposed to all have that moment of either this has just solidified everything or... Oh, it's, it's this one. So there's that. 
the murder oh yes it just needed a, a little cube of sugar just a little cube of sugar helps the pumpkin marsala chai tea go down <laughs> I'm weird. Just ignore me. So there was that one and that was great. And I followed that up with another fabulous audiobook. book. Uh, the, the narration. Oh my gravy. But I have to buy this book in paperback. I have not done it yet, but I'm going to because the unlikely yarn of the dragon lady by Sharon. Is it Sharon? Yeah. Sharon J. Mondragon. Mondragon. By Sharon J. Mondragon. If you took, again, it's another, a man called Uba meets Mrs. Kip meets Sensible Shoes and smushes it into one, uh, just, wow. Such a, such a, such a good book. All right, so in this one, <laughs> there is a church that has a prayer chapel where this group of four ladies get together and knit prayer shawls, which they then, you know, give out to people who for whatever reason, need the encouragement of a prayer shawl. Now, I used to do my writing down at the local prayer house, and they have a prayer shawl ministry. And if someone uh, was walking through a, a tough time in their life, sometimes it would be, you know, terminal illness. Other times it would be someone in their family's terminal illness, and they need that comfort. Sometimes it was just, you know, a wayward child or, you know, the loss of a job or whatever. Didn't matter why they would be given this prayer shawl and the prayer shawl would have been prayed over as it was being knitted as well or crocheted as well as uh you know at the end well the same thing here well the the church is in trouble it's dying and their new pastor is there to revitalize this place or close it down he doesn't want to close it down um, I'm, I'm getting the feeling it's like Episcopal or Anglican or something like that where there's a bishop over multiple churches and, you know, you've got the, a, a different kind of hierarchy that I'm personally accustomed to. And so I, I, I believe that's what the deal is. But he decides that he wants this prayer group to meet in public. So he gets a guy to paint the prayer chapel so they can't meet in there. You have four ladies kind of like in sensible shoes very different personalities and one of them is you know pretty much a self-important dragon lady she really is and god just gets a hold of this group so she is balking and fighting this all the way to basically starbucks and barnes and noble that's what this really is they don't say that but that's what this is and so they meet there twice and then they're kicked out of there by the manager who wants nothing to do with them and she is awful. So then they start meeting in this little sofa area in front of Macy's and people start leaving them prayer requests on napkins and then telling their stories. And then one lady starts teaching one gal to knit and then another gal wants to knit for her baby and, and they start praying for the relationships and for the, and the church starts growing and it's, this woman is losing it because she's losing control and what is going on and she, it, she becomes pretty much impossible pretty much like that manager of the bookstore and then there's this big convergence it is so beautiful it is it's just amazing when there's a, a book where god gets a hold of people and makes tough but necessary changes we're talking about watching sanctification in process and it is oh man this is women's fiction at its very, very best. It's not just this big emotional fest that some women's fiction can be. This is digging deep, rooting out the sin in our lives and what is God going to do with it and how we're helping each other doing it. It's iron sharpening iron. It's, you know, the, the prayers of the saints. And I mean, it's just, I can't say enough good about this book. It will be in my top five. It's up there, right up there with Saving Grayson. In some ways, if I had to recommend a book, and I'm saying a lot of great things about Saving Grayson because I love that book, but if I could only recommend one of the two for most people, 
that's just most. I would definitely recommend The Unlikely Yarn of the Dragon Lady. It is so good. I will be buying several copies actually to give away as gifts because that good. And if you like audio, yeah, get the audio because the audio, mm, so good. Another sip. Then I read my, this is my Chantal Reads All Day. So we were supposed to go to page 50 of the book we read the month before, which I can't remember what that book was. Uh, I think it was uh, To Write Wrong and find a, pay, a word on the page and that word has to be in the title. That word was hope. So Room for Hope by Kim Vogel Sawyer. Guys, this book will rip your heart out, stomp on it, twist it into knots and shove it back in and say, fix yourself. <laughs> it's just, it is heart wrenching, but it is so, so beautiful. Oh my goodness. This is a beautiful story. So I remember my friend telling me about um, her grandpa I don't know, in West Virginia, and this might, is this West Virginia? No, this is Kansas. But I think her grandpa was in West Virginia, almost 90% sure. And he was a sheriff, and he would go all over the county because he was the sheriff. They found out years later that he had like six families in the county. And I mean, it was just, whoo. Well, that's kind of a very similar story to this one. They, are, they run a mercantile, this woman, and her teenage twins run it while her husband's off getting supplies from everywhere. And then he comes home. So he's like home for a month and gone for a month and home for a month, and right? Well, so when he's home, life is beautiful. They love him. Everything is grand. He's a wonderful husband. He's a wonderful father. Every person in town thinks he's amazing. And the same is true of a town a few, like a couple hours drive away in a railroad town. The same is true for those people and his wife and their three children. And then one day the sheriff or a deputy from that other town shows up with all his things that hasn't been sold to pay his debts. He shows up with all these things. They put that in the barn and here are three, his three children. And she's trying not to show that, wait a minute, this is my husband. They think that this deputy thinks it's, it's his sister or something because it's their aunt. Yeah. And it's, there's a whole lot of deceit when people trying to hide the truth, A, she's trying to hide it from her kids. She's trying to hide it from the town because she knows the town will look down on her children and those children. And she doesn't want to keep these kids because these kids are proof that she failed her husband by not being able to have more children. It's just this big, ugly, ugly mess. And I love that the author didn't take a romantic thread where she could have. I, I expected one thing, it didn't happen. Um, there is a romantic thread. It is crazy minor, which made me super happy because it's not the point of the story. And it was, it, this is just, it's got a beautiful minister who really, so this minister is just really supportive and wonderful, even though he knows not everybody is going to be. And then when things get ugly, he gets up there and he has a what for to it. People do. They they almost end up with nothing. It, if you read Though None Go With You, this is kind of like the 1930s version, of, uh, just a part of it, you know, because if it can't go wrong, it does. And where's your faith? Where are you putting your trust? Because if you're putting your trust in your neighbors who have been there for you all this time, you're going to be disappointed. It was so, so, this is Christian, this is the kind of Christian fiction I love because it focuses on what the church is, what it's supposed to be, where it fails, and what does the Bible say. And it does it without preaching. So there's that. Next up, I read Phantoms, which is book two in the Shallows series by Denver Evans. I could have looked at the cover. <laughs> but this book, guys, so this book... You know, Shallows was such a brilliant twist on mermaids. And this one, obviously, it's got the Jolly Roger. We're going to be dealing with pirates. And I'm like, how can you do such a cool twist on mermaids and pull off 
you know, the, the same with pirates. But she did it. It's like, who are these pirates? Because these pirates act, act really strangely. The waters aren't safe. People, ships are going missing. People can't find their, you know, loved ones. And it, there, it just one question after another keeps coming. And you're like, you're getting closer and closer to the end of the book. And there's just more questions. And you think, I, 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 ma. I really didn't know if she could pull this off as I'm reading it. I was enjoying every bit of it, but I was like, this is going to fall flat at the end. And it didn't because it, all those questions, even though it feels like they're only making like this little mystery of what this pirate thing is, even more of one, it's really answering too. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like snowballing down the hill, you know, it was so good. It was so fun. The characters, this one went a slightly bit more romancy than the last one. It's still very light, which I appreciate. It's YA, but it doesn't feel like the angsty YA-ness that is like, don't say that. Just don't ever say that. It doesn't feel like angsty YA fiction. <laughs> let's, let's make it that way. <laughs> so now I got to know the next book is Legends. I don't know what it's about. I don't care because this was great. I loved it. I think I gave the last one four stars because I didn't know what to give it. This one was an easy five stars and I think the last one was better. So I'm probably going to have to go make sure that I haven't upped it. And if I haven't upped it to five, it needs to be five because comparing these books to what they are, what they promised to deliver, they delivered it in spades. And so they, they should have five stars. So there's that. I did find my other book. It was under my book nook thingy. All right, we're gonna close that tab. And then I read Mandy by Julie Andrews Edwards. Yes, by um, Maria Von Trapp. <laughs> so this book was delightful. I really loved it kind of has a Anne Shirley meets Secret Garden meets um, kind of the Enchanted Barn from, I don't know, there's just a lot of things. But what it, what is really neat about this is that Mandy's a really sweet girl. But she's also, she's never had anything of her own. She's an orphan. She lives in an orphanage. She's never had anything of her own. She doesn't have parents. She has no memories of parents. And she discovers this little cottage and starts cleaning it up and fixing it up and making it really special. And she doesn't want to share it. So she hides that she has it from everyone. Well, then things get a little spicy because to pull it off, she has to, she starts having to lie. She starts having to be evasive. She starts hurting her friend by, you know, avoiding her and the friend knows it, that things get ugly. And that was good, actually. It just kind of shows that even an understandable selfishness is still selfishness and it still hurts you as much as it hurts everyone around you. So that part was really good. Sometimes the writing fell flat. It just, it just did. It, there was just, there were just places that it was kind of like, there were also several, several instances of an irreverent use of God's name, which in middle grade did not make me happy. And there was at least one actual foul word. And I was like, why? I mean, what is the point? And especially since I think this was written in like the 90s or something. I'm like, why? I was, I was really upset. No. Even worse. It was written in 71. So when I was a year old and they couldn't use some of these words on TV, it was in this children's book. Why? I don't know. So, but I gave it four stars because outside of the occasional flat, it wasn't always flat. It just sometimes it just kind of went, mm -hmm. um, but it's a really sweet story. Uh, if you like Anna Green Gables, Secret Garden, that type of story you're going to like it. But there's there's definitely things that you probably won't like about it if you're anything like me. But every book can't be perfect. Although I do have a perfect book coming. Oh, I can't tell you how much I love this other one. 
And oh, looky here. It's next. Yay. Okay. Guys, I got this in. It was not on my TBR, I don't think. But when it came in, it, it went straight on it. The Lost Library by Rebecca Steed and Wendy Moss. Oh my goodness, guys. This, I don't know if one of them is the illustrator and one of them is the, they must just both be telling the story. But, okay. We got to talk about this book. There's so much to tell about this book. I even, I even tabbed, I, I do not usually tab a middle grade book. I don't, but I did this one. Listen to this. I am not upset when others don't love the books I love. We each have our own book spaces inside us, and they do not match up perfectly, nor should they. The club members said goodbye that day as usual, all of us feeling like good friends. And I'm actually even going to go up. I'm going to read up above that because there's, there's context for this that is really kind of cool. The book club rug was our safe place, a place where you could say what you thought. One day after I shared a particular book, one that meant a lot to me, a club member spoke up to say he had read it already and found it extremely boring. I listened to him and he listened to me and that was fine. Where have we lost this in America in particular? I'm just saying, how, why, why can't we just go, hey, you don't love what I loved? Okay, I don't care if I say I don't like, I loved this, and someone else says, I don't like that part of it. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I understand that. Actually, I think this about it, but I see your point, or I don't see your point, but hey, whatever. I don't care. If you don't love what I love, that's okay. If I don't love what you love, that's okay. And I love that it's in this book. Because we kind of got, we're kind of teaching kids that everybody has to have the same narrative. And it's driving me insane. So here's a book that says, no, we don't. And I'm like, thank you. Uh, oh, there's just mm, so much, so much about this book. But anyway, now look, in this book, I don't know if you can see. I have no idea what the camera is going to do with this. But I don't know if you can see that. But there are ghosts in this book. And usually ghosty things are not my thing. They're just not. This worked for me completely. I loved it. There, I figured something out that these ghosts are doing. I guess that's how you would put it. And then later I realized I should have figured it out way sooner. And so there's, there are a couple of mysteries in here and they do get solved. So it is kind of like a middle grade mystery, but it is also just, I love the fact that, okay, so here we got, we're in this book, I'm not going to keep holding it. In this book, we have a town that is a community and they all kind of work together. So they, they interact with each other. People are pleasant. It's not utopia in that everything's perfect. We're not talking Stepford here. It's just, so in here, Evan has a friend who's a couple years older than him and already in middle school. Evan talks to this kid and this kid is nice to Evan. He's not bullying the younger kid or dismissing the younger kid. He's being friendly. When the class goes to the middle school, which is in the next town over and they all visit to kind of take a tour of where they're going to be next year, the kids in middle school are nice. They're not, you know, just saccharine. Or anything. It's just, they're just pleasant people. Because why wouldn't we be pleasant people if we can be? And then Rafe, his best friend. Oh my goodness. This is what I see in real life. That I rarely see in books. Okay. And I'm the one who wrote the book about the brattiest kid on the planet. Okay. <laughs> and so I'm just saying. But Rafe has overprotective parents that make helicopter parents look totally grounded. That was a good line. I might need to use that someday, somehow. But anyway, <laughs> but no, seriously, though, those parents of most helicopter parents look normal compared to his. His parents have rules for everything. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you told me there was a rule for how to blink. They're just, and they kind of have reason to be. This Rafe is kind of a natural daredevil. And so there's all kinds of rules about things he can't do. And he shows respect for his parents. It's not that he likes the rules. He pushes them as far as he can without breaking them. 
he's going to make sure he gets as much, but they work with, and, and because they work within the bounds of those rules, it limits. So it, it, the solving of this mystery becomes harder because they're still working within the bounds of these. It's so genius. This book, oh my goodness. If you read one, and it, it's really weird because this book takes place in like the end of spring. You know, it's almost at the end of the school year. The whole thing feels crazy autumnal. And it's not just because of the poor misunderstood orange cat. <laughs> no, the town comes together and builds this little free library that just starts with one. And there's just, there's so much, oh, there's so much going on in this. It is a multi-layered, really wonderful book, and everybody needs to read it. And that's all I got to say about that. No, it's not. I could talk about it all day. I loved that book so much. So next up, I read Murder on the Rocks by somebody McInerney. Karen. Murder on the Rocks by Karen McInerney. So this one, she's opened her inn. She bought an inn on an island. She opened the inn, and... It's not going all that well. And then this guy gets murdered. And she looks like she's... They, they have a, a police chief. And I really don't like the dumb cop police chief thing. That This is, this is one of two books that I read that use this thing this time. Where the basically the lazy... Oh, it just... Mm, it makes me so mad. But... At least not all the police in this were bad. So there was that. But there, it's, it's, it's hard for them to find the clues. They have to work for it. Not everybody is just really good at things. More than one person dies. The, there is a relationship in here and things get, I don't want to say intense because that almost sounds like then there's going to be some sort of closed door scene. It didn't go that way. But I could see that it might eventually uh, in the series. But I'm going to continue the series. I think I gave it four stars. Let me look. Um, yeah. One of the things that I liked the most is that I kept saying, oh, it could be. No, no, it can't because. Oh, but then I. And I was constant back and forth. It kind of um, unlayered things slowly but surely. Who I thought it was from the beginning is who it was. But it was one of those things I had nothing to back it up. It just felt like it had to be basically because of how you write a mystery. And But I didn't have anything to back it up. So I kept expecting her to throw a wrench in it. So I was looking for other people and I was looking for other things. And because of that, it almost caught me by surprise when I discovered, oh, wait a minute, I'm right. You know, and so that was fun. That was really fun. I did not appreciate the occasional foul word. It's like, really? So in this book... There are basically the equivalent of two affairs going on. And it's not that I was bothered necessarily by the fact that they exist in the story. Because they were behind the scenes things that we find out about for the most part. We don't really see it for the most part. That was good. There was one spot where there's this flirting going on. I didn't appreciate it. But... I think what bothered me is that for the most part, it, it was almost like this is, this is the way things happen and oh well. And that bothered me a lot. I'm like, no, not oh well. It, uh, anyway, that bothered me, but I am going to keep reading this series. What is the series called? Uh, da, 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 da. Grey Whale Inn, this is mystery number one. So the Grey Whale Inn is the name of her place. She's hoping to keep it going. And so, yeah. But it was good. It was it was really, really good. And then um, I'm going to do the next one that's like that because I want to I want to leave one book for the last. I've got three mysteries in a row here then. The Secret Book and Scone Society by Ellery Adams. I listened to it on audio, the background music. I know a lot of people love it and normally I would, but I think it was too loud. I, it felt like it was fighting with the narrator. And it wasn't that I couldn't hear the narrator. Heard the narrator absolutely fine. And for the most part, the narrator herself was really good. But, man, it felt like it was fighting. It was too much. Not all the time. Sometimes it was perfect. And I liked that. But 
I would have preferred silence to what we got for the most part. But the story is, it's really kind of neat. So our main protagonist, Nora, owns this bookshop and she considers herself a book therapist. And so people come in and in a, in a similar vein to Milton with saving bookstores, she kind of helps people using books. She'll give them, I know there was one person who is tr struggling with his relationship with his adult daughter. And one of the books that she gave him to read was Little House on the Prairie. And I thought it was really cool because I could start thinking, I could start seeing her logic behind what she's recommending to what people and, and all the stuff. And I just want to make sure that candle, no, it's fine. Uh, but, you know, that part was really good. Then there's a lady in town that bakes scones based on what she thinks someone needs, what will just meet them and make them feel good. And so, you know, people will go sit in her shop and wait half an hour for a custom made scone, you know, and then somebody is murdered. And those two ladies plus two others end up working together to try to figure out, wait a minute, what? And they uncover all kinds of stuff. They fumble, they bumble, they do a great job. It's kind of like women's fiction meets mystery. I just figured that out. Huh. But it is because, I mean, they're, but instead of the, because, I mean, they all have secrets. All right. And slowly we get to see what their secrets are and how they have to, they're going to help each other work through them and all the stuffness. There's lots of underlying issues that kind of interfere with the way that they do things. They, they don't get away with everything they try, but they manage to get away with enough that they can keep going forward and yet it's believable it was it for the most part it's a pretty good book i gave it four stars there are random well randoms the wrong word there are occasional foul words thrown in here or there most of them weren't gratuitous and i don't think most of them i don't think irreverent uses of god's name was a part of most if any of it I can't remember, but I don't remember, I don't remember that. I remember just excrement and, and, you know, just sending people to the nether regions and, and, you know, things like that, that I didn't appreciate. I, I just, mm, like I said, they weren't often and they weren't uh, gratuitous in that they're just using them for a comma, but it was still like, mm, no, there's a kind of a slight feminist undertone to it but it's not too strong and this one also had the jerk of they call the they call the local sheriff the toad because he is just awful a lot of like misogynist awful awful attitudes toward women and I, like I said I get sick of that this is the 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 third one that actually had that kind of thing running through it, I think. But what this one did a little differently is they gave a reason why these men were the way they were. It was a little stereotypical and it felt like kind of too easy, kind of just, yeah, I don't know. But, but... It was still a really good thing. I gave it four stars. I liked it. I'm going to I'm going to listen to the next one. And as long as we keep there's a, a slight romance with an awful lot of definite chemistry and uh, physical attraction. It didn't go too far. It certainly it didn't even get anywhere near a door, much less closing it. But it's still you you can tell that you know people are just much more you know accustomed to. That kind of thing that I am. I when I mention it, it's because if it's in there, I'm uncomfortable. So most people aren't even going to notice it. I think this is one of the ones where people wouldn't notice most of it. Okay, I, I'm I'm just saying, but I definitely did because it makes me uncomfortable. So there's that. And then one more book before I get to my last. I did with Mitzi. Mitzi reads and writes. Uh, the Secret of the Old Clock. First Nancy Drew. This one, it was a, it was a fun read. It's really funny, but it was actually better than I remembered as far as, you know, a kid's mystery. I remembered them being, even as a kid, I remember them being really easy to figure out, but they were supposed to be, right? 
And because, I mean, for one thing, you have this, the title, The Secret of the Old Clock. Where, where, what do they need in here? They need, all these people expected to get something from this guy's, you know, estate when he died. And then none of them did. I've got a hair on my face and it's driving me nuts. Ugh, there. And, <laughs> and so they all expect this. So obviously there has to be another will, right? It's the secret in the old clock. So we know that either the will or the means of finding the will will be in an old clock. All we got to do is find out what this old clock is. So, I mean, even as a kid, I could figure this stuff out pretty easily. But as I was looking at this, I saw a lot more nuances than I caught as a kid. And so I think it's going to be a lot of fun to reread them because there, there were a couple of things. Uh, can I remember what they were? There were a couple of things in here that contradicted themselves. And I thought that was really funny. And what I don't know is, you know, they've updated these. This is probably the, because it's got this for the inside page and this cover, and this is not the one with Nancy with her 60s flip hair. And so I'm thinking this might be like 40s, 50s-ish. Well, when they, when they've updated them, you know, they gave them different, they gave her, like she, I think originally she had a roadster and now then she has a convertible. And then, you know, there's all these, these changes that they made to update the books. And I wonder if that happened during those updates. So there's just that. Uh, I need to figure out how to use her boxer thing so I can see if anyone else has brought that up. Cause I'm wondering, I'm just, I'm just wondering. But anyway, so I read that. It was a lot of fun, nostalgic and all the stuff. Okay, the, the last one I read was Seek and Hide by Amanda G. Stevens. Now, I read her No Last Days series. It's a um, quartet, tetralogy, whatever you want to call it. And I loved that. Guys, this book. So, the idea is that as of the opening of that book, and I think it's from like 10 years ago, um, that the book was published. In that world you know, in that time, six years ago, the Supreme Court made a ruling that basically said that Christianity was a hate crime and it became illegal to practice orthodox, if you will, Christianity in America. Bibles were outlawed. You had to turn them in, get rid of them, whatever. They were rewritten with basically a health and, you know, wealth and prosperity kind of gospel thing with you pretty much being God. Those are the only things you're allowed to have. So Bibles are really scarce. They're really hard to find. And if they find out you have one, you get sent into a deprogramming thing. And it's scary. It's really, really scary what they put you through. It, guys, it was so real. This book was so real. It felt like I could be watching what's happening next door. With, with the, the attitudes of we're going to rewrite history that is going on right now and with the attitudes that your, your religious beliefs aren't acceptable to the modern narrative so you're not allowed to have them. Yeah, it, it was chillingly familiar. And on top of that, you had a really just really good story. So... I'm going to really try hard not to give too many spoilers, but there could be some. I will say that I could give you every single spoiler in the book, and I don't think you would care if you started reading it because I can't, A, I can't do the spoilers justice, but B, the book is just that good. So in this, in this thing, we have a guy, Marcus. Marcus has a, a woman that he is in love with who will not have a relationship with him. Although you kind of get a feeling that she'd like to, but she just won't. And you get the feeling that it has to do with his faith, and it's not. She is a nurse, and that's important. Then there's an underground church. Some people have Bibles or sections of Bibles. Some people don't. I'm telling you, I read this book and I immediately went, so when I was in school, a little aside, but when I was in school, we memorized the Bible with King James because all of our schoolwork was done with King James. And in ninth grade, we memorized 
the book of James and the first three chapters of first Peter. There were only eight months of school. So that's all we memorized. You know, the, there was like two weeks after that. And so we didn't, we didn't have a whole book for that. I mean, a whole chapter for that month. I went and got it out. I'm like, I've got to make sure that I can still remember it because if, if this came down tomorrow, I could write out the book of James from memory because of that school. But I want to, I want to keep it fresh to make sure I don't miss anything. And I have it word perfect so that I don't change the order of words or anything that could possibly change the meaning without meaning to. I want to make sure I got it right. So, I mean, I'm going to be refreshing it. And oh, by the way, I'm going to memorize the last two chapters of first Peter because it's silly not to have both books. That's two books that I've, I, I've taken care of mine. You guys can deal with Psalm 119. I mean, <laughs> But no, you know what I mean? So I, that's what it made me do. That's, this is Christian fiction at its finest. It's like, it, it gets you involved and it gets you, you know, focused on what does, what, what does this apply to me? How does this, oh guys, it was so good. So then in addition to this side story, or, or there's like two stories that converge the other, on the other side of the coin, you have this young woman who has a baby who denied God when they came to her. They were taking away her baby. She was pregnant. They were going to take away her baby. And she denied God to get her baby back. And now she's an underground Christian. She's repented from doing that. And I kept thinking of Peter. You know, I just... Ugh. And then that actually comes into the story, by the way. There's this moment where there's this whole... She's having this whole personal struggle with the fact that she denied God and... And someone, you know, brings Peter into it in a, in a really cool way. And I was like, yes, yes, it was so good. But anyway, and then this, this book, the, the primary storyline does wrap up for this book. But I don't know that anyone would be completely satisfied with just this book. I was satisfied with finishing the book because it gave me a place to pause until I'm ready to pick up the next one. I wanted to go just get it right then. And I was like, no, I have other books that I need to read. So I'm not going to do it. But I wanted it right then. The characters are well written. They're believable. The The guy, Marcus, he's so... <sighs> I've met people like him. And my heart breaks for them because they're, they're in, in trying to serve the Lord, they're like going completely on at it on their own and yet they're they're living and serving the Lord and it was it was so good this guy takes so many risks to try to help Christians and there he's like creating his own little underground you know protect the Christians and it is beautiful it is wonderful it is seek and hide it is Amanda G. Stevens and you need to read it today I mean, if you hate Christian fiction, then obviously you don't want to read it. And I'm so sorry. But, but for the rest of us, I'm just saying, whew, it was really, it, it's very well written. It's very well told. And I've got to know what happens next. 16. So I read 16 books. Actually, it's not as many as I thought. I read 16 books in, in September. And considering that I lost a week, that's not too shabby. That's not too bad. But, uh, so I don't know what I'm going to be doing on Thursday, but I'll figure it out between now and then, and I'll see you later.